Well, I don't know if you noticed it this morning yet, but, but my ship has come in. <laughs> I've been waiting a long time for that. <laughs> it is, it's just, it's marvelous being part of this fellowship with you. It's, it's uh, you know, it's good to be here this morning with you. It's good to see your smiling faces and the love and the presence that we can feel here. This is going to be an incredible week. The, uh, we have 15 people who have left a few days ago to go to Ghana, 15 adults there. They're going to be serving there over the week and a half. That's marvelous. Uh, wonderful. At 1 o'clock, we've got 31 of our young people going off on their trip to West Virginia. And I'm not sure how many adults are going, but uh, probably 10 or so. Uh, So that's amazing. We have 185 adults signed up to serve during VBS. 185. That would be like this whole room, 185. Over 305 kids are signed up right now. We've got 31 of the high schoolers, junior highs on the trip, and we've got over 70 signed up to come to VBS. Over 100 of those young people are actually coming over these next four or five days to do things for the Lord. Isn't this awesome? Yeah. Yeah. It feels more awesome to me than to you, but there you go. (laughs) And I'm one of those 10 adults going with the young people on this this trip, so you can be praying for me. (laughs) I'm not going to be seeing uh, that little ant colony of everybody at this VBS, but it is is incredible. I'm telling you, when you come and watch it, just walk around. It, It is inspiring watching all the people do what they do. It is, it is just amazing. So this, this is one of the big highlights of, of what Crossroad has learned and what Crossroad has become, that we serve one another, that we love one another, that we care for one another, that we're not just taking care of our own, we're taking care of other people also. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. So today we're going to continue on with some of the ideas about authority, but I'm going to touch in on some of the things we've spoken about. You know, we spoke about the, the end, the, what's in our future, and how we are to be living examples of that future. People should see in our lives here a picture of what they don't have, that we have a hope, that we are walking in a faith, that, that we are literally being changed by the Holy Spirit who is taking us to our future. And why does the world hate Jesus and why do they hate us? Because they don't understand us. We don't look like them and we talk about something that they don't understand. You know, I would have told you I was a Christian before I became one. I was religious. The world understands religiosity. It doesn't understand relationship with a living Savior, a living Lord. If you watch the opening of the Olympics, you saw a couple different things that were basically insultive toward Christian life. And why is the world getting so bold at being able to say, we really don't like you guys? Because the more we walk away from our God, the more we say that we weren't created by him, we're we're just an evolutionary accident. Is it any wonder then that we, we lose the blessing? of who God is in our lives. The world's losing that blessing. The world is, is hating us more and more. But we have to know and we have to decide who we are. Do we go with the world or do we go with our Lord? Do we go back to our past or do we keep showing the life of the future? And we live it right here on our way to it. Amen? Amen. So, is there pictures in the Old Testament of what we talked about last week of our future? Because we looked at that and said when, when God comes to be with the, his people in the holy city, it says there is no temple. 
There is no place, just God is there and God is the light and the, the Lamb is the light and then He puts Himself in us. We're the light. It's pretty amazing. The future we're headed to. Amen. By the way, the lady I went to see and, and who was given two weeks to live and she only had about eight or nine days. I did her funeral yesterday. But I talked about the joy of being with her. I was only with her about 25 minutes and how wonderful it was to speak to somebody about their future and to watch us be able to, to enjoy one another's presence, to be able to tell her that Jesus is bringing us all back to a place where our mindset is that we are equal. That even though he's going to pass out rewards, even though we're going to to know according to what we've done, who we are. You know, I gave her that example. I said, the Lord may say, well, Rick, you're a general, and, and, and sis, you're, you're a sergeant. But yet we're going to say, thank you, Lord, but we're, we're going to understand his heart, and we're going to say we just throw it all down at your feet. Yeah. You know, the Bible says when he comes back on that white horse, he has many crowns on his head because we've gotten rid of all of ours. We've given them all to him. Then the Bible says he takes all of that and he gives it to the Father. We're going to know the distinctions. We're going to know who each other is. But yet, we're also going to know we don't want that to be barriers. We're going to be one up there. We're going to be one like we've never understood one before. It'll be an incredible blessing. Well, is there a picture of that in the Old Testament of that future? And there is. I hope you can see it today. It's going to be in the life of David. And I want you to look at this in, in 2 Samuel in chapter 7. This is God speaking to Nathan the prophet on, on what to say to David. It says, Now therefore thus shall you say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. If you remember, David was the least of his family, when Samuel came there to find the king, his father didn't even bring David out. He just left him in, out there taking care of the sheep. He, he just said, it can't be David. He's the least of us. You know, look at all my other boys, how great they are. But, but Samuel says, well, I've been to all of them, and God didn't say these are the ones. Do you have any other boys? And he said, well, I got my youngest out there, you know, that little nobody. <laughs> He said, well, bring him in. And that was the one God chose. And here, God's telling Nathan, you tell him I did that. You tell him he was out there following sheep, but I called him out to be a ruler of the people over Israel. Keep going. And I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you and have made you a great name like the name of great men who are on the earth. So... I took you and I made everybody around you know who you are. Everybody around you is thinking about David. What is different about David? David has a heart after his God. Oh, my dear church, if, do you have a heart after God? Because if you have a heart after God, your neighbors should know who you are. Your community should know who you are. Your, your county should know who you are because you got a heart after God and, and therefore God has blessings going on that people can't help but notice. Come on, church. Don't you understand? So keep going. We're going to drop down to verse 12. And when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, so he's telling him when, when you pass, when you pass away, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom and he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom for a little while. Forever. Forever. This is, uh, this is something different. This is what we call the Davidic covenant. This is God making a covenant right now with David. If you remember, Saul was chosen first. King Saul was chosen first. But his heart turned. He was going after God, but his heart turned. And he started not doing it God's way. He started seeing himself as king and began to be prideful and arrogant and thought he could do other people's jobs. And, and he didn't listen to his God anymore. 
a matter of fact, God came to him and said to Saul, Saul, I would have given you everything. I would have, I would have given it to your generations forever. But, but you didn't want to follow me. You know, we never know what we lose when we decide we're not going to follow after God. We never know all the blessings we're going to lose when we don't listen to who he is. We never know what we could have had and we start losing things because we, we're not close to him anymore. So he told Saul, I'm going to go look for somebody who's got a heart after me. Now, David has now walked with God and David has served. Now, now God is doing the next step. He's given him what we call the Davidic covenant. And he's saying, it's going to be forever now. He said, I will be his father and he shall be my son. And if he commits iniquity, talking about his future generations, Solomon and the other kings. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. Meaning, I'll use other nations to hurt him. I'll use other nations to diminish who Israel could have been. If they're not walking with me, they're not going to get away with it. And maybe, you know, you don't get away with it. He says, what you sow is what somebody else is going to reap. Is that what he says? No, he says, what you sow is what you're going to reap. Don't think you're going to get away with things when God knows how to measure the heart. He says, so I will chasten him. I'll use the rod of men to do it. The other kingdoms around him, the other kings. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Because what is he talking about there where he says, I'm not going to take it away. Well, he went to Solomon at one time and says, you know, if it was based on you, you would lose everything. He said, but because of your father, David, it's not going to happen. Solomon got so bad and different ones got so bad. But the Lord would say, because of David, it's going to stay in. Who's going to end up reigning on that throne? Remember when Mary was going to conceive that child? She was told that he would have the throne of his father, David. So there you go. Jesus is the one who's making that throne go forever. But it was David's heart, and because of that, because God would then show mercy, because if it was based on what, they, what these other people were doing, they would have lost everything. Aren't you glad for the mercy of Jesus? Yeah. Aren't you glad he has a covenant with his Father that is unbreakable? Amen. See, we don't have it. He has it. Yeah. Da- you know, Solomon didn't have it. David had it. And so God said, I didn't take it away because of David. Well, we mess up all the time. Don't you mess up? I, I want to continue to grow and be like him, but along the way, I've done plenty of stuff to mess it all up. But yet God knows between him and his son, the Lord Jesus, it's a solid covenant, it can't break it. And so I get mercy because Jesus has done the right thing. I get something that, that even though I mess up, it, it, that covenant can't be broken between him and the Lord. So therefore, we've got a wedding day coming. That's where I get in on his, the strength of his covenant. We've got a wedding day coming. That's where I get in on predestination. We've got a wedding day coming. That's where I get in on the fact that we are rulers and kings and lords, all in his kingdom. Come on, church, do you understand that? So... David's family is going to be blessed because of David. We are going to be blessed because of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Keep going. Now, uh, I want you to see this, uh, verse 17. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord. So David goes in and sets before the Lord. How, How can he do that? How can David go into some place and sit down before the Lord? Well, it's because of the the Ark of the of of the Covenant is is with people now. It's in his city. It's in a tent right there. It's not like the tabernacle in the wilderness that had barriers. It's not like the temple they're going to build that has barriers and hidden inside a holy of holies. He can literally go in and sit down, and it's right there in front of him. You know, the pictures we got of like uh, 
what, what is it, the Raiders of the Lost Ark? You know, and they're all freaking out about the, the Ark, and, and they open it up, and, you know, they get burned up. The dude melts in front of the Ark. That was that scary part of, of the Ark of the Covenant. But in this picture, David comes in and sits right in front of it. What is this a picture of? Well, if we read it last week. It's a picture of our future. It is a picture of the future. In the last day, he said he's going to restore what? The, the temple? The, no, he says the tabernacle of David. He's going to restore the fact that we're not separated anymore. Aren't you glad we're going to a place we're not separated anymore? Yeah. Amen. So David goes in and he sits right down before this, this thing that represents the presence of the Lord. And here's what he says. Who am I, O Lord? Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? And yet this was a small thing in your sight, O Lord God. Who am I? Why have you done this to me in my house, yet it's just a small thing for you to do this for me? Have you ever had a moment with God like this? Have you ever had a moment that is so rich, that His presence is so big, you can just bask in it, and you can have that who am I moment, because you realize you didn't bring yourself here. You didn't choose Him. He chose you. You didn't bring yourself this far. You didn't give yourself this, this weight lifted off your shoulders. You didn't give yourself this peace. He did it. It's his presence. It's his incredibleness to you, the blessing to you in your life. Have you ever had that moment that you're able to speak like this? And you also have spoken of my... Keep, keep going... And you also have spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come. Well, forever. A great while to come, forever. Is this the manner of man, O oh, oh Lord God? No, it's not. Now what more can David say to you? For you, Lord God, know your servant. For your word's sake and according to your own heart, you've done all these great things to make your servant know them. You learned anything about God? Has God opened up anything to you about who he is? Then you ought to just humble yourself and say, what? That's such a small thing for you to tell me who you are. That's such a small thing for you to tell me about my future. That's such a small thing that you've prepared away for me. Who am I? When Jesus said to them, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you. You know? And he said, listen, if it wasn't true, I wouldn't tell you about it. Who are we? We're loved by God. And to discover that you're loved by God, to discover that he's done stuff for you you could not do for yourself. It's just a humbling moment. doesn't matter how, how big you get. doesn't matter what place he gives you. It's incredible to know you didn't put yourself there. He did it for you. He called you out. He called you to be different. Keep going. Therefore, you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you, nor is there any God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. I love that. He said, Lord, look at all you've done. I'm sitting here before you. Just humble. I, I can't believe all that you've done. And so you are great. And, and on top of that, there's not one single thing we've ever heard about any other God that is like you. You are it. The things you have done are what God has done. Do you know that so many things have happened to put the message of our God out there to the world? You know, they, they, they do movies about it and they did all kinds of stuff to let the world know there is a God that they've never heard anything like it in their ears. They ever heard anything like our God has done. Yet many of them will not serve him. But I thank God we've heard it and we've responded to it and, and, and he blesses us in ways that is unfathomable. 
And we humble ourselves before him and say, who are we? But thank you, Lord. Who are we? But thank you for loving us. Now, I want you to see this before. This is chapter 7, but we're going to back up into chapter 6. This is when they brought the ark in. This is when they brought the ark into the city of, of David, the ark of the covenant. And they tried to do it before, but they didn't do it in the way they were instructed to do it. They didn't have people carrying the ark, the, the Levites. They had them on an ox cart, and the ox cart was coming in, and they thought they were doing the right thing, but they hadn't taken time to find out how to do it properly. So in their zeal, they weren't counting God as holy as they should have counted him. And the ox cart hit a stone and, and it caused the thing to wobble. And one of the people just tried to steady the ark and put his hand on it. And you know what happened? He died. And David was shocked and, oh my dear, what are we going to do? And they paused everything and they left it right there at Obed Odom's, or Edom's, Obed Edom's house. And they said, let's just regroup. They left it all there, and he was sorrowing that, wow, we, we're not sure what happened there. And what happened was they didn't read on how to do it the correct way. And then the, David got word. David got word three months later that somebody said, do you know Obed-Edom's house is blessed? He's been blessed for three months now. The Ark of the Covenant has been on his house and on his property, and we're telling you the blessing is overwhelming on Obed's Edom's house. And David couldn't stand it anymore. <laughs> he said, we got to get the Ark of the Covenant into our city. How many of you know, if God's in your house, you ought to be blessed. They, they ought not see foolishness in your house. They ought not see a house that's going down and not being taken care of. They ought to see a house that's blessed. If God's in your house, how come your house isn't blessed? Come on, church, you ought to have an expectancy. Oh, that if God is with me, there ought to be a difference between my house and the God that he's not, or the house that he's not in. Come on, church, do you understand this? Don't we have a faith and an expectancy and a, a belief in our God that, oh, my dear, if we got him, he leads the way. I am wiser than I was without God. You know, I've told you the story of somebody who's making the same amount of money that, as, as I was, and they, and they were always asking, how come you always got money and I don't? I'm just saying, I'm listening to, to God. I'm listening to, you know. And he makes it go farther. He, he makes me wise. You know, it, we don't have to be all that. He, he can take the same amount of money and make you more blessed. You can get the same amount as everybody else. I'm telling you, if there's a famine in the land, your house ought to be blessed. If the country's going through a rough time, we all go through it together, but we ought to still be blessed in it. Yeah. Now, I've told you, pray for our politicians and everybody, because whatever they do, whatever laws they make, we're going to have to live in them. But no matter what is going on, they ought to still see God moving in your house. Come on, church. So David said, we got to get that here. So... So this time they, they did it right and they had the, the people carrying it right and they, they brought the instruments and they celebrated, play, played all kinds of instruments it said. And, and, and listen, let's go to it here. This is uh, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 13. And it said, so it was when these bearing the ark of the, of the Lord had moved six paces, they sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. Six paces. So let's, I, I assume that's six steps. You know, maybe big steps, but, but six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, pause. Let's offer another oxen and another fatted sheep. What is this a picture of? Well, two things. One, it's always a picture of Jesus. I don't get the blessing of God except for the sacrifice of Jesus. But there's also something else. David has made a decision. I'm going to sacrifice for my God. I, I, I'm not going to let everybody else do it. I'm going to sacrifice for my God. This is going to be costly for me. I, I want God to come in and I'm going to celebrate and I'm going to show him I am not unwilling to sacrifice for him. What's your heart toward God? 
Does your walk with God not cost you anything? Does your walk with God cost everybody else something? But you, it doesn't cost you a thing. Let me tell you, you want to draw near to God? Then make sure you're ready to do sacrifice to God. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. How many did a sacrifice of praise? We were, we were talking about praise. They were talking about lifting up hands. They were talking about all that. Did some of you go like, I'm not going to do that. They were singing and praising like crazy, bringing in the ark. They were worshiping God. David says he danced with all of his might. He was praising God with all of his might. This is a joyous thing. God's coming to my house. God's coming to my city. And we are praising. We are sacrificing. It does not matter that it's costing us money. We are willing to have that, to have the presence of God in our house, in our city. How many came here today, but you weren't ready to sacrifice? You're looking at everybody else raise their hands. You're looking at everybody else do it. But you're not going to tell me what to do. You're not going to make me do anything. Do we not know God looks at our hearts all the time? Do we not know when we are resisting the Holy Spirit that the Lord can go, I see that. You know, he says how you measure is how it's going to be measured back to you. He says, if you draw near to me, then I draw near to you. Yet, we have a hard time sacrificing to God. We have a hard time going against our pride and our ego. And it's like, you can't tell me what to do. We have a hard time looking foolish sometimes for God. You ever see them, they go to churches and they, and they love putting us on the secular things with us raising our hands. You ever seen that? They're showing us with our hands. And what are they trying to do? Well, let's show them so we can look at them and say how foolish they look. You see, they don't understand. They don't understand what it means to God. He says what? Lift up holy hands in the sanctuary. That's what he says. He says pray, lifting up holy hands. See, God understands it. God knows what that means. The world does it, and they will use it to try to shame you or embarrass you. And some of us, we bought, bought it, hook, line, and sinker. sinker. You can't make me do that where we ought to learn to maybe sacrifice. We ought to learn to put our pride down and be willing to lift up a hand and say, Lord, you, you are God, not us. We lift up hands of surrender to you, Lord. You do what you need to do. Yeah, praise God. So every six paces, they, it costs them. They were willing to sacrifice for the Lord. Then David danced before the Lord with all his might, not part of it, all of it, and was wearing a linen ephod. Was wearing a linen. Let me just say it this way. He didn't dress like a king, he dressed like us. How about that? You mean the closer we get to the Lord, the less we want separation? the more we want equality. So he literally is not dressed as a king, even though he is a king, but he's dressed as one of us. What's our future? We will have all our distinguishes, differences, but yet when we're with each other, we don't want them to separate us. So even though he's the king, He's celebrating with the whole body about the presence of the Lord, which is going to be our future. And what happens? The distinctions disappear. All right. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet and every other kind of instrument you can think of. It said they brought them all out in earlier verses. Keep going. Now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David... So now it's, it's, right, get, it's starting to get into the heart of the city. 
Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord. So it's coming into the heart of the city. She wasn't out there in this celebration. It says all of her, all Israel was out there. So we already get a picture that her heart is not as committed as David's. And, and all of Israel. And she looks out a window and here it mentions not David, it mentions King David. Because what is she looking for? I'm not looking for my husband to look like everybody else. I'm looking for my husband to look like royalty and kingship. And she looks out the window and despises him in her heart. He's praising God with all of his might. He doesn't have the kingly garb on. He looks like everybody else. And when she sees he's acting like that, she despises. Notice when her name is mentioned, it's also mentioned with King Saul. Remember who King Saul was? The one who got prideful on himself. The one who wanted to be king. The one who not only wanted to be king, he wanted to do whatever he wanted to do. So they brought the ark of the Lord and they set it up in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected or David's tabernacle. There are no walls. There are no barriers. There's no separate. The people and the singers, everybody can go and there it is. They can see it and they can dance before the Lord. They can praise before the Lord. David could set before the Lord. What, what is this a picture of? Our future says, and they saw the holy city which is all the believers, and God was in the holy city, yet there was no temple. He was the light of that city, the Lamb and the Father, and we also have a light. In a, we're all in this together. There is no barriers. This is our future also. Okay, then keep going. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. So all these people, all Israel was there. He just blessed them. He just blessed them. Here he is, the king, who's dressed just like them. And he's just all together with them. So yeah, we know who I am, but I'm with you today and I bless you all. I've just sacrificed so much of my money, in a sense, to the Lord to celebrate bringing all this in. And then what did he do? After all those sacrifices, all that preparation that usually wouldn't go to the people, these sacrifices would go to the priests and they would go to that whole system. But what's going to happen today when all those barriers are down? Look what it says. Then he distributed among how many people? To all the people among the whole multitude of Israel. All Israel, anybody of Israel who showed up, Michael didn't. All of Israel that showed up is going to get a blessing. Both the women and the men. How many of you know? The women and the men are equal. How many of you know that? Yeah, we are in the kingdom. Both the women and the men to everyone. Everyone. They got a loaf of bread. They got a piece of meat. They got a cake of... See, this normally didn't happen. There was only special people that that would happen to. And now God's doing it for everybody because this is a picture of the future. Not of the system of that moment. It's a picture of the future. Everybody got that. So all the people departed and everyone went to his house with all this blessing. Their, their homes were all blessed. Then David returned to do what? To bless his household. Now I'm going to bless my house too. I bless everybody else. I'm going to bless my house too. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, and you might as well hear the mocking voice. Remember, her heart despises him right now. Once again, she's identified with King Saul. Oh, how glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants. And as one of the base 
fellow shamelessly uncovers himself. What was she saying? You didn't represent your royalty. You didn't represent your kingship. What is she speaking about? The heart that she understood with her father. No way would her father identify with the people. He was prideful in his position, and so was she. And she said, I can't believe you've done this and embarrassed us so today. You did not identify with your kingship. You identified with the people. And, 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 and he's mocking him. And how you, you let the, the women not see you in your royalty. You let them see you like you were just any other person. And what's his response? So David said to Michael, it was before the Lord. And then he says it, who chose me instead of your father and all his house. Because he knows what he's hearing. He's hearing the heart of Saul through the daughter, Michael. So he said, I just want to remind you, God chose me. Who? Somebody whose heart's after him over your father. And you're giving me your father's attitude? Instead of your father and all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord. Therefore, I will celebrate. Therefore, I will dance before him with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my might, with all my strength. I'm going to thank him for what he's done for me that I couldn't have done for myself. And while I'm doing it, I will identify with the people that he put me over. I am not greater than them. I was chosen for this position, but it does not make me greater than them. Keep going. And I will be even more undignified than this and will be humble in my own sight. You think, you think you're upset at this? Well, you're going to keep seeing it. You're going to keep seeing it. I don't think I'm all that. You think I'm all that. I don't think I'm all that. I know I got here because of God. You, you act like I'm something, like I made myself this, or I should act that way. I'm not going to do it. Amen. You know, I think about when, when Absalom had rebelled against David, and he's going out of the city, and he still had soldiers there with him, and somebody started throwing stones at him and calling him names and said, you deserve this. And, and the soldier said, should we go kill him? He said, no, leave him alone. He said, God's either for me or against me. He's going to raise me up or he's not. He said, leave him alone. That's the heart. That's the heart. I can get mad and we can go kill that, that guy for being like that. But right now this is about me. And God's either going to give it to me or he's going to take it away. I'm not going to act like I'm somebody that that dude can't do that right now. I just think that's the humility that he kept showing. Was he perfect? No, he messed up. And did it cost him? Yes, it cost him. But he always had a heart to remember he didn't bring himself there. God did. But as for those maidservants of whom you have spoken, by them I will be held in honor. By them... They will remember that I'm king, but they will celebrate that I identified with them. They will remember who I am, and they will give me honor, but not just honor because I'm the king. They will give me honor because I identified with them. And what's our future? We'll know who Jesus is, but he's going to blow our minds when he identifies with us. When he's willing to say, you have taken all the rewards I've given you, all the crowns, and you've cast them at my feet, and I'm gathering them all up, and guess where I'm going to put them? I'm going to lay them down at the Father's feet, that he might be all and all, and I will turn and identify with all of you. And oh, my dear, is he going to get honor and love when he identifies with each one of us. When the two become one, 
Jesus in the Father, the Father in Jesus, and them in us. And what's the last word? Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, who identified with her father, who had the attitude of her father, had no children to the day of her death. Why did she not have the fruit of a marriage? Why did she not have the fruit of children? You may say, well, God just made it so that she couldn't conceive. I don't think that's it at all. Once she despised her husband, she no longer had fellowship with her husband. Without relationship, how are you going to have a baby? And so the woman who despised her husband for identifying with the people of Israel lost all relationship because she didn't understand her future. I hope today you can understand your future and that you're going to rejoice with all these people this week who don't make themselves all that. They're making it about somebody else. The 15 people who've gone this week to go make it about somebody else in Ghana. It's going to cost them all money. They didn't go there on our dime. They went there on theirs. Come on, church. We help a little bit, but we don't do it. You notice we're not inundating you with saying, give us money so we can go on a mission trip. You notice you don't get all that? Why is that? Because we sacrifice every six paces to do the will of the Lord. We're not asking you to be the sacrifice for my journey. I'm going to sacrifice for my journey. We help and we encourage and we do some things, but we make sure that the people are sacrificing for their own journey. Come on, church. And, and so they're doing that this week, and, 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 and we're going to have these kids go, 31 kids, and they're going to go off to Steve Wingfield's lodge, and we're going to open up trails, and we're going to help a few local churches there. And there's going to be leaders there with those kids, and it's not going to be about us. It's going to be about them, but, but we're all going to be in this together. We're going to make it about somebody else instead of ourselves. And there's going to be 185 adults who are going to be leaders and people of authority who are going to show kids the way and people are going to blow whistles and say, okay, it's time to shift. And there's going to be wonderful people who's going to be cooking food for them and teachers who are going to be instructing them in the things of the Lord, trying to put something deep into their hearts. Why are they doing it? Because they know we only have a short time to influence these kids who are what? Our equals. We're not better than these kids, but we've given a moment of authority that we have over them to be able to instill in their lives. And, and we're doing it, we're sacrificing our time. We're sacrificing what other things we could do. For who? For this relationship with our Lord, to give relationship to somebody else, to consider them valuable enough to sacrifice for. This is going to be an awesome week in, in the life of Crossroad. An awesome week of it not being about us. An awesome week of walking in authority and the authority structure. And the more we know it, the more we understand it, the more blessed we're going to be. And, the, and, and we can bless one another and we can be grateful when we simply say, wow, who are we that, Lord, you're going to bring this blessing? Who are we that with all that labor and all that work, yet we're going to be more blessed doing that today than staying home and watching the Olympics, you know. And some, some of those people in the Olympics, that, you know, these directors of it, they don't like you very much anyway. How about we hang around with the people that like us, the people that love us, and we're going to sacrifice for one another. And if the world could come in without, they won't even be able to comprehend it, but they'll just look at it and be able to say, my, my, how they love one another. How about we give them that message this week? How about you be a part of that message? Be that part with me, amen? Why don't you stand? Praise God. woo -wee. All right. You know, and there may be somebody here right now who may be uh, in the midst of saying all these things, you know, this is, this is your day. It's time to put Jesus in charge. It's time to stop resisting. It's time to let him have all that we are. It's time to join the party. 
it's time to join the celebration. It's time to sacrifice to the Lord. It's time to let him reign and rule in a way that he's never done it. For some of us, even as believers, you know God's asking for you to come to that place. And for others of us, maybe right now we know he's not Lord and I need to make him Lord. I need to receive the work of the cross, be grateful for what he's done for me, and put him on the throne. If that's you, brother, sister, I'll lead you in a prayer, committing your heart and life to him. And your brothers and sisters that have done this, they're going to be happy for you. They'll support you in the prayer. But you need to be bold in front of men and women. Be able to raise that hand and say, it's me, Pastor Rick. This is my day. If that's you, then be bold. Raise that hand and we'll say this prayer with you, committing your heart and your life to the living God. Anybody need that prayer today? Raise your hand up high and we'll, we'll say this prayer with you. All right. I don't see any hands. I'm going to trust and believe that we've done that. All right, church, you know what we got? Seven days. days, Unless you're coming back tonight, then you only got about a few hours. But (laughs) seven days before we come back here. Boy, let's not waste it. Man, let's have the light on. Let's shine for Jesus. Let's do what he's called us to do. Let's make a difference in the place he's put us in our neighborhoods, in Sussex County, in Delmarva. Let's make a difference. Amen. Well, Lord, thank you for this word. Thank you for your love. Thank you for all the things that are going to happen. Lord, we, li- we lift up the, the, the VBS and, and all these wonderful volunteers that are going to be doing something. We ask your presence to be working mightily there with all these kids. And, and Lord, for the, the trip to Ghana and for the, the, the youth that are going on their trip, just, just blessing everywhere, Lord. For everybody that's going to come, the adult classes that are going to happen, at the VBS, bring, bring the adults back to participate in those classes. And we'll just give you glory for what you've done. May we just have an incredible seven days of revealing who you are in our lives. And, and as we rejoice and just are humble before you, may you increase, may you increase, and may we decrease. May the world see you in us to your honor and glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.